And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Walt Whitley. Dr. Whitley practices at Eye Care Associates of Nevada in Sparks, Nevada, where his practice encompasses ocular surface disease, glaucoma, surgical co-management, and clinical research. Prior to relocating to Nevada, Dr. Whitley helped create one of the most premier surgical co-management networks at Virginia Eye Consultants. Dr. Whitley is nationally recognized as an author and a lecturer and serves as co-chief medical editor for Modern Optometry, and he's an editor for many different publications. You've probably seen his work in a million different things. He was the immediate past president of the Virginia Optometric Association, and he was recognized as 2012 Young Optometrist of the Year and 2015 Legislative Key Person of the Year and most recently, 2020 Optometrist of the Year. I've known Dr. Whitley for a really long time. He is a very sought after speaker on dry eye. So we're very, very lucky to have him with us today. He's a good friend and I know you guys are gonna learn a ton from him. Welcome Dr. Whitley. Well, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here, Stephanie. And uh, woo you, uh, I, I, you know, working, working with uh, Stephanie, over the, over the years has been a great pleasure and uh, thank you so much for having me here. And then for all of you here, thanks for being here as well. So I know you've all talked a little bit about sclerals. I'm not gonna tell you about that because I know nothing about sclerals. I've seen maybe one in my career. I refer a whole lot out. So we know it has a great role in ocular surface disease. And so definitely something that we should be co-managing with, uh, with some of our colleagues. So whether you do it or not, we have friends that can take care of our patients for that. And I know Mark talked about something, something dry eyes. So, but whatever he says, just do whatever he says, because I'm sure, uh, you know, he gave you some great pearls that you could bring back uh, to your practice to benefit your patients. I was, talked to, I was asked to talk about lids and MGD and blepharitis. And everyone's like, oh, this is such an exciting topic. Let's talk more about lids. But it's so important for us to talk about the lids because how many times have we had that patient that we put them on lefitograst and they've been on it for six months or longer, or maybe cyclosporin, they were on it for a year or longer. And they're saying, hey, I've been on this medication, but I am still symptomatic. And the reason why is because we've ignored the lids. And you know, about a decade ago when the various uh, mybographers came out and we started looking at the various thermal pulsations, it was, we realized we've been overlooking this uh, for years and if we don't take care of the inflammation, which is with the cyclosporin lefitograst steroids, as well as take care of the lids, whether it's anterior blepharitis, posterior blepharitis, or MGD, patients are still gonna be symptomatic. So that's one of the take homes for you all. Treat the inflammation, but also treat the lids and the meibomian, uh, meibomian glands. I do work with several companies uh, within this space. And this was an article I wrote, actually I wrote it with my, my brother. My brother's an OD as well. And, uh, and so actually I made him write the whole thing and I just fine tuned a little bit of it. Uh, so four steps to beating blepharitis. And essentially with this, we know that there's various, uh, various presentations of blepharitis. Venturino did a study about a decade ago and found that about 24% of patients had, had posterior blepharitis. 21% of patients had uh, dry eye disease, but then another 12% had anterior blepharitis. And so it's important for us to address it, whether it's staff and they may have some of the, the mild uh, crust or maybe a little bit uh, uh, sticky on the eyelids. If it's ulcerative, where they have the, 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 the thick plaques on the eyelashes, really crusty uh, that some patients may have. Uh, seborrheic, maybe a little bit oily uh, for some patients. But then also the uh, Demodex. And so Demodex is something that we've all been overlooking and I'm going to uh, talk about some uh, potential new treatments when it comes to Demodex uh, blepharitis. And so it's always important for us, yes, we love to go to that nerve or we love to put a scleral lens on the eye, uh, but it's important for us to take a look at the lids to make sure that they're clean, but also that they're functioning properly, pro properly whether it's with our meibomian gland imaging, which helps with the structure, but we also have to take a look at the function and press on those glands to see what is coming out. Is it clear oils or is it inspissated toothpaste or maybe nothing coming out of those lids? But then also on the lids, it does it have the normal color and contour or does it have some notching? Does it have some telangiectasias where we know whenever we see that, those patients would be a candidate for something such as an IPL or radiofrequency 
or perhaps a low light level therapy for the patient. So where were we about a decade ago? And so a lot is going on within the ocular surface disease space. So about a decade ago, patients came with anterior blepharitis. We said, well, you have anterior blepharitis. You have bacteria on your eyelids. We need to address it. So we can do the warm compresses, lid scrubs, topical antibiotics, perhaps a steroid as well to calm down the inflammation. If it's severe, then we're definitely going to do the combination drop. Uh, most combination drops has tobramycin, which is a good gram positive, great gram negative, including pseudomonas. But, it, but it'll also be combined with either lodopredinol or a dexamethasone. And so we know that that's how we took care of the anterior blepharitis in addition to cleaning off the lids with the lid scrubs and lid wipes. Looking at MGD, hey, you have MGD. Well, here, we want you to do a warm compress. Well, don't do a warm compress, just prescribe a heat mask. A warm compress does not stay hot long enough. The patient, if you can use a warm compress or, or washcloth, you need to do the core bundle method where I don't even know how to do it, but I know you have to get like eight or 10 wash rags. You gotta get some really hot water. And each, each time you take a rag, you put it on your eye. Once it cools down, then you take another one, but it's, it's a intense um, uh, protocol that you have to use where it's so much easier for say, hey, I'm gonna prescribe a booter mask for you. I want you to put in the microwave for 10 seconds. You can re retain heat for about 10 minutes, but it's gonna help keep those glands uh, open and it's gonna be your daily lid hygiene. And so with the uh, mybelming glands uh, 10 years ago, artificial tears, topical azithromycin, which is still a great medication off label. We know azocyte is indicated for bacterial conjunctivitis, but it is something that we can utilize because it does have, uh, it does penetrate into the, into the tissues as well. Oral tetracyclines, and then if it's severe, all of the above, combination drop, heat, but that's where we were 10 years ago. That is not enough anymore. And so if you're doing this, this is old school. We need, you see some of the, the exhibitors out there, whether it's gonna be IPL, whether it's a mask, whether it's a steroid, whether it's a thermal pulsation, or whether it's a heat with manual expression, this is what we need to do to benefit our patients, but also a byproduct is gonna benefit the practice uh, as well. Whenever we're looking at MGD and blepharitis, this is a whole spectrum. And so this is all part of dry disease, even though MGD had their own workshop. You can see the callouts here. When it comes to the TFOS dues too, some of the main points that I got out of it is 80% of dry eye has both an evaporative component and an aqueous deficient component. So you do have to treat both. And that goes back to what I said earlier, treat the inflammation, but also treat the mybomine glands and lids as well. Second, anyone can get dry eye, whether they're young, whether they're old. We know many of you probably uh, screened some patients with mybography imaging. And if you have a young patient, uh, Priya Gupta did a study out of Duke. And in the study, the kids were anywhere between five and 17. And what they found is about 42% of those patients had some gland dropout. And, and so it's important for us to take a look. But why do these young kids, why does a five-year-old have gland dropout? It's not necessarily any of the risk factors. They're not staring at the computer screen 10 hours a day. Well, maybe they are. But this might be a normal part of the, the, of the aging process. And so that just may be that kid's issue. And so, but something that we do have to, to, to look at, but then also the neurosensory abnormalities. Who does uh, corneal sensitivity testing? And so that is something that, that we, any, anytime a patient's coming in for a dry examination, that is part of the examination. And so whether you take a uh, cotton tip applicator, whether you take dental floss or a tissue, what we do is we check, or in our practice, we check the central cornea, superior, inferior, nasal, and temporal. And we want to see, do they have normal sensitivity? Some pa most patients do, but the reason why we do the different quadrants is uh, if patients have, let's say a previous herpes or viral keratitis, or let's say whether it's due to simplex or zoster, they're gonna have desensitivity in certain areas. And so that's gonna help us identify those. But either way, we know that we can address it. So with some of the biologics to get those nerves functioning properly, so we can increase the, 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 the cell density, but also the corneal nerve sensitivity, whether it's through the amniotic membranes or biologics such as synergimin. And so those are some of the call outs that, I, that I've seen. We've all, or I took away from TFOS dues too. Here, looking at the mybomian glands, and we're all familiar with this. Patients have about 30 mybomian glands superiorly, about 25 inferiorly. 
We know each gland has the mybocytes, it has the ductules, it has the central duct, and then it's gonna come out of the orifice. And we know at the end of the orifice, that is where the real lens muscle is. So the blinking exercises, having those patients do the heat, but then having them blink, squeezing the real end muscles help to squeeze some of the mybum out onto the, onto the ocular surface. It is densely innervated, function related to hormones, growth factors, and neurotransmitters. When we look at the spectrum of dry eye disease, we know the root cause. So 86% of all dry eye does have an evaporative component. And whenever we're, we're, we're looking at the ocular surface, the root cause is going back to those meibomian glands. So making sure that our patients are doing daily hygiene, lid hygiene, to make sure that, that they're functioning properly, but also if they have any dropout, if they have poor functioning glands, we have to get them working better to help give our patients clear, comfortable vision, but also to make sure our patients are, uh, are, 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 are feeling well and seeing well on a daily basis. And so if there's MGD and there's a disruption, what happens? That leads to hyperosmolarity, that leads to the inflammation and the vicious cycle for dry eye. What happens during MGD? Well, it's hyperkeratinization. And so we have these uh, keratin proteins that are built up. And essentially what they're gonna do is they're gonna block the ends of the gland. And so that leads to the backup, that leads to the loss of function, that leads to the atrophy, and this is something we have to find ways that we could intervene. And so some of the pipeline medications that are, that we, we know we have stuff that work now through the various in-office procedures, but we potentially have other ways that we can address the keratin to help with our patients with MGD. So the keratin essentially is gonna plug the gland and lead to the, uh, the, the stress at, at the lid margins. Education is gonna be key from our staff, from us as well. This is your condition. This is what we're going to do about it. And this is what you need to do about it. I'm gonna prescribe the various treatments and medications, but I'm gonna see you back in a month, two months. We're gonna reassess your eyes. Dry eye, MGD, this is a chronic condition, right? Where there's no cure. And so we have to manage it. And we're gonna do the various things that we can help manage your condition over your lifetime. Mrs. Smith, your, the front surface of your eye, it looks like coarse sandpaper. It should be nice and smooth. Or Mrs. Smith, your tears should, should last on your eyes for 10 seconds. For you, it lasts for about three seconds. And so that's why I'm gonna recommend, uh, recommend thermal pulsation, which is gonna increase the tear film breakup time by about 2.6, 2.7 seconds, and almost double how long the tears last on your eyes. Or Mrs. Smith, these are your glands. We took a picture of your glands. Here you can see you've lost almost 50% of your glands. We need to get these glands working better, and we also want to make sure that these don't get worse because if left untreated, this will get worse over time. And so this concerns me. And if you tell your patients, and I learned that from Paul Carpecki, if you say this concerns me, your patients are going to be like, wow, they're going to listen and say, hey, I better do something about it. Or you can tell your, pro your patients, hey, you have mice weights on, uh, mice, mite waste on your eyelids. And you don't want that stuff on your eyelid. So this is why I'm prescribing the tea tree, tea tree oil. This is why I'm prescribing micro, micro blepharal exfoliation to make sure we're cleaning this off, but we may have potentially have a new treatment option in the, in the near future for that uh, as well for Demodex. So why is patient education so important? Well, it's all about managing the expectations. I had a patient yesterday or a couple days ago that had maybe lost about 75% of her glands. We did thermal pulsation on her and uh, she came, or my tech warned me ahead of time. She goes, uh, the patient's not in a very good mood right now. She said, this is a waste of her time and money. And so I, I went in there and started talking to her. I said, hey, well, remember. Or I said, well, first, are you doing your heat mask? Heat mask I prescribed still. No. Are you doing the lid hygiene, the, the spray, the hypochlorous acid? No. Are you using the medications that I gave you? Well, sometimes. Well, also, I need you to do that because you have to, this is your condition. This is not mine. I'm trying to give you the tools to help take care of your condition, but I wanna go back to when, we did, when I told you about the thermal pulsation. I said, most patients feel 50% better on a daily basis. I didn't say that was you. I said, hey, I'm not expecting you to have a huge uh, symptomatic relief because you've lost a significant portion of your glands. For you, we wanna get these working better so that way we can give you the best 
optimal surface for your uh, for your for your eyes. And so education is always going to be key. Uh, um, managing the expectations, uh, encouraging our patients, you know, letting them know the number. So if you use tear osmolarity, patients want to know what their number is. And we'd like to keep it around below 300. And if it goes up, we're going to do something else. We're going to prescribe an anti-inflammatory. We're going to do a plug. We're going to do something else or maybe a procedure to help with the homeostasis of the tears. But have a written, written plan in place, um, giving them handouts because they listen to us and then they forget. I mean, I forget. I listen to the doctor. I forget half the, half the stuff they say as well. But if they gave me information so I can go back and read is only going to help. And so this was a lecture I gave a while ago, uh, but we, we pulled the audience and um, for what resources do you use for patient education? Majority have their own office made handouts and uh, there's various ones. This was at my previous practice, telling the patients how to do the warm compresses, how to do the lid hygiene, the bleaking exercises, and then prescribing a drop. So whenever we're prescribing, patients have already tried three different artificial tiers for over two, three or three different tiers over a couple of years. So the worst thing you wanna do is go, hey, here's a new flavor of an artificial tier, All right? So because patients, they, they, they're coming to you to help address their condition. Giving them another tier is not gonna address their condition. But when it comes to tiers, we wanna make sure these patients, we're prescribing an artificial tier, they're gonna use at least twice a day. We wanna make sure it's preservative free because we know BAK does have a cumulative effect on the ocular surface, on the glands. And so prescribe something preservative free, prescribe something with a lipid based tear. Why? Because we know 86% of dry eye has uh, evaporative component. But utilizing this, uh, I have various examples, feel free to email me on that. But where are we on the strategies when it comes to the uh, treatments for ocular surface disease, in particular MGD? We have the tears that we just mentioned, the nutraceuticals, whichever one you feel is best. Make sure you take a look at the science. See what was the studies when it looks at dry eye and also what are the benefits that the patients are seeing. There's several products that have very good science behind it. There's other products, there's zero science behind it. Either way, whenever patients are coming in, prescribe a tear, prescribe a heat mask, uh, prescribe something to keep the eyelids clean, but also prescribe a nutraceutical because it's gonna work on the inflammation and the dryness from the inside. And if patients are already on a fish oil, what I tell them, I say, well, don't waste what you have, finish what you have, go up to about 2000 milligrams. But then when you finish, here's my recommendation for uh, the nutraceutical that I feel is gonna work best uh, for you. Lid margin disease management, the heat compresses, poor compliance. How many people flossed today or last night? Wow, that's a way more than I expected. Normally it's 13% of y'all. Uh, j and did a study many years ago looking at flossing. And we know that we're all told to floss, but what they found is 87% of patients floss infrequently or not at all. And this is something we're told we're supposed to do. And the ADA does a great job in that education portion of it, but it's, uh, that's why it's so important with education each and every time from us, from our staff, patient engagement software, sending them reminders on why they need to do the various treatments. Prescribing your lid scrubs, if they have Demodex, the tea tree oil um, is, is gonna be beneficial for the patient. And then we're gonna go over these various in-office procedures. Topical anti-inflammatories, we have many uh, that, are, that are available, amniotic membranes, but also neurostimulation. Who's utilized uh, the neurostimulation so far? With Oyster Point, Brendaclin, how's it been so far? It's different. Patients aren't patient. I mean, it's new. You're like, hey, we're going to put this. Uh, there's, a, there's a spray. You're going to spray it straight in your nose. It's going to stimulate the trigeminal uh, gland or nerve, and it's going to help with the basal tear. But when we're thinking about MGD, right, where we want, we're trying to improve the surface. We're trying to uh, help with address the meibomian glands. But whenever we're utilizing neurostimulation, whether it's with the pharmacological, with Renaclin and Oyster Point, whether it's with external mechanical stimulation with the I tier 100, this is what it's doing. It's creating a basal tier. So it's increasing the Schirmers, but it's also working on the mucin layer. It's also working on the goblet cell layer. So opportunity for us to help our patients. Dry eye homework. So prescribe whatever you feel you need is gonna work best for your patients. 
And so pick one. I mean, there's just so much confusion. So if you're going to prescribe us, if you like a certain tier, buy it, sell it out of your practice. If you like a certain mask, buy it and sell it out of your practice. Why? Because it's going to be convenient for the patient. It's going to help increase compliance because they're going to get it better. It's going to avoid confusion because when the patients get that retail confusion, they see the, the pharmacy, there's everything on the pharmacy. And then cost, we, could, we can price things comparable to make it affordable for our patients. But uh, making sure that we have these available for our patients. This is new lids. And so this is something going to oscillate. This is the water pick for the eye. And here you can use whatever cleanser that you feel is best. You can buy the unit, you, you, you sell it to the patient. And so the patient, uh, after they're done brushing and flossing, then they're gonna do their new lids to help keep those eyelids clean. But it's not just for the eyelashes, you're also gonna go on the meibomian gland. So you're gonna remove some of the hyperkeratinization. You're gonna remove the biofilm and that's gonna help, help with maintaining that lid surface or the lids and the ocular surface. And so it is a handheld unit, it oscillates. Uh, there's been some studies on it looking at the self-administration uh, for patients with dry disease, blepharitis, and MGD. And here you can see pre-treatment versus uh, post-treatment. It did improve the symptom scores. Looking at the osmolarity, uh, or, or tier, sorry, uh, the osmolarity, it did improve from 315 to 306. Looking at the tear film breakup time, increased by a few seconds. And so this is something that we can prescribe to our patients and something that they can do to own their condition. Uh, this was, a, uh, this was a, a, a study, they were looking at uh, uh, donor corneas and they wanna make sure that utilizing this new lids device is not gonna have any impact on the ocular surface and it was proven to be safe and no impact there. There's been over 750,000 treatments with the new lids procedures, and it's been found to be uh, very safe. Here's something else that we can prescribe for our patients. And so instead of, hey, get this hypochlorous acid, I want you to get this foam, I want you to get this mask, what you can do is make it all into one. And so this is called uh, Evertears. And essentially, you all know those little heat packs when you go um, skiing, or maybe you like to ice fish, um, or whatever outside cold. So you open up the bag and it gets hot pretty quickly. This one, you click it on, uh, there's an activator in there, so it can get hot within a matter of seconds. And so this also has a surfactant in it, so it's gonna have heat. You heat on the eyes for about three minutes and then you wipe off the lashes. You flip it around, heat for about three minutes, then wipe off the lashes and then throw it away. So these are single use uh, treatments, so pre-moistened uh, heat pad and cleansing pad. And so for this, it does get up to about 40 degrees Celsius. It does last for almost about seven and a half minutes for our patients, but then something that's easier for them, one thing versus getting a spray and a mask. And so something that you can consider. This is the iTier 100. You can talk to Dr. Blumenstein about this. Uh, uh, he's used this before, but essentially, actually this is the one thing, I'm gonna recommend read directions. So when I got the unit, I did not read the directions. I said, oh, look, it looks easy. You just put it right there. And so I, I did it. Don't ever put it right on that bone because it's like a jackhammer. And so you're going to feel that. You're going to definitely tear. But what you want to do is go just below the bone. And that's where you're going to externally stimulate the trigeminal or, or stimulate the nerve in the trigeminal gland. And that's going to help improve the basal tear uh, production. And so here's a video. This is from Laura Perryman. And so here, doing the external stimulation, mechanical stimulation, 30 seconds on one side and 30 seconds on the other side, you're gonna see the increase of basal tears that the patient uh, is, uh, is improving on. So great, increased tears. Well, what else does it do? And so here's just looking at the Schirmer score. It did increase the Schirmer score. The stimulated is gonna be in orange. L looking at the OSDI, the symptoms. So patients, so moderate's gonna be about 23, 24 or higher. These patients were up, up to about 40, but here you can see improvement by almost one grade level of the OSDI, which is symptoms that patients may have. Looking at the meibomian glands, so helping improve the basal tear, you can see increase in the meibomian gland expression for the patient. The, also the, the gland secreting clear liquid fluid, you can see that's increased as well. But also here's the subject here, looking at the ocular surface, improvement in the ocular surface, doing it twice a day, 30 seconds, both times to help improve those tears for our patients. 
So our patients, we're all going to have that patience that I don't have time. I don't have time to sit and do a heat mask for about five to 10 minutes. Well, good news, we have this. Now you can keep your eyes open the whole time. And so, and also if you like the opera, you can wear the mask. But here you have this gel pack. So you, so you get that hot and then you, you put it together and then they can do the warm mask for 10 minutes and they can do whatever they want. So now they can't use that as an excuse that they don't have time to address their lids. But here you can see up to about 14 minutes, it is able to maintain about 40 degrees uh, Celsius for our patients. And so open air, patients can still do whatever they need, but main thing is making sure that patients do get the heat that they need for their eyes. So how do you simplify over-the-counter treatments? I already just mentioned that. Whatever you feel is best, make a strong recommendation. Don't say, hey, try these five flavors of artificial tears. Do whatever you feel is gonna be best for our patients. Looking at pharmacological ways to innervate the, the nerve, 34% of basal tear production is due to inhaled na uh, nasal uh, passage. And so the parasympathetic nervous system regulates a lacrimal functional unit, which is accessible within the nose. So we stimulate the trigeminal nerve, improve the basal tears once again. So this is looking at varenicline. And so this is the nasal spray that many of you have had uh, opportunity to utilize. If you have it, prescribe it. You're gonna see, uh, you're gonna see the benefits for the patient. We're still all trying to figure out where it fits in. I've been using it on the drug naive patients. I've been using it on my very difficult dry eye patients that have tried every single thing, but it's something that I've noticed that patients are utilizing artificial tears less. They are feeling better. Yes, they may sneeze, and in the clinical, uh, clinical studies, about 82% of patients sneezed after spraying it. So you, you have the spray, you tilt your head back, right hand, left nostril, shoot it toward the left ear. You don't jam it up the nose, so you just put it partially, partially in, and you don't have the patient snort it as well. And so that's some of the things that we, that we don't want. Here you can see the improvement in the Schirmer score, but also the eye dryness score. Zero is not dry, 100 is super dry. Here you can see the improvements uh, that the patients did, did appreciate. Looking at corneal staining, uh, total, temporal, and all the various regions, you can see the impact that it had on corneal staining for our patients. And then going and then going back to the, the side effects, there were zero ocular side effects. So these were four-week studies. And so you can see the 82% well, not here. If you combine this one and this study, it was 82%. But that means the patient sneezed only at least once throughout that 28 days. It didn't mean the patient was gonna sneeze every single time. Some patients, it does get better over time. I've tried it. Sometimes I don't sneeze, sometimes I do. But patients, they're like, hey, my eyes feel better. I'm not using the drops as much. And so you're gonna find many patients are going to benefit from, uh, from this, this treatment. What about in-office procedures? And so there's several different ones on the market that we're gonna go over, but this segment is growing. This is how fast it's growing. I showed the slide, it was 4% yesterday and today it's 5% because I didn't update that last slide from yesterday. But here, 5% of the procedures, looking at the market revenue, over the counter, you can see, you can see the, the prescription medication, but here, helping our patients, this is their issue. It's gonna help improve the signs and symptoms, of the ocular surface disease that, that they're having, but it's also a way to grow your practice. Why? We know the insurance uh, reimbursements is not getting any better for both vision or medical. And so cash-based services benefit our patients, benefit our practice, so an additional revenue stream. You've all heard about the uh, vector thermal pulsation for many years. And so we were one of the uh, first earlier adopters in Virginia. And so we had one of the first units it works great. I've probably done about 4,500 of these procedures over the years. And I can tell patients confidently, you're going to feel 50%, well, depends on their meibomian glands, that on average patients feel 50% better on a daily basis, but also getting those glands working and functioning better. But doctor, how long does it last? How often am I going to have to do it? There's a, here's a study from Griner looking at patients. Here you can see at three years, meibomian gland secretion scores increased from baseline to one month, Improvement persisted at three years relative to baseline. Yes, the patient's still gonna need their drops, they're still gonna need their, their, their lid hygiene and their heat mask, but it does help with the secretion. At the symptoms, 
Symptoms not as much. One month, uh, it did improve, but returned to baseline levels three years later. For the speed score, did decrease from baseline to one month, but it did. This one did improve. And speed, the speed survey looks at the severity and frequency of the patient's uh, dry condition, but it's more specific to MGD. Looking at tear care, I know that they're out there as well. So heating the eye about 113 degrees for about 15 minutes, and then immediately afterwards, manually expressing. So one of my buddies, uh, Tom Chester, this, Tom, if you're watching, this is the third shout out I've given you uh, this weekend. So with this, he goes, hey, I've had thermal pulsation. I'm told that it's, make, it's expressing the glands. This one, I heat it, I can see the mybum. I can see the oils coming out. I can see the, the toothpaste. And so I know that this is working for our patients. So you're gonna heat the outside of the eyes. Uh, patients can go look in the optical. They can read a book. They can do whatever they like. Then afterwards, you can express the lower and upper eyelid. And one of the other benefits of this, we are gonna have some of those patients that do have segmented uh, uh, glands. So maybe they have a total gland dropout nasally, but they do have a significant, uh, they still have glands temporarily. And so we can do extra treatment specifically for those glands. And here's a, here's a study, the Olympia trial. Uh, one of our colleagues, Jen Lowe, she presented this. This is a non-inferiority study. So whenever the, the new technologies are coming out, how does it compare to lipoflow, the initial thermal pulsation? Here you can see increased total breakup time. In, uh, over time. Here you can see the meibomian gland secretion scores, very similar between the two. Looking at the symptoms, the OSDI, here the patients are improving in symptomatology. But then here, 72% of the tear care versus about 59% of the lipoflow subjects improved by at least one OSDI category. So from severe to moderate, moderate to mild, mild to better than mild. And so this is another option, Very, there's no footprint. You can put it in a drawer and whenever you need it, then you can move it to whatever exam lane you want. So that's another benefit of having that procedure. So what about the uh, other thermal pulsation? We can also do personalized care with the handheld unit. And this is from Alcon where you have the smart tip uh, applicator there. Uh, here's a video looking at the procedure. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna heat the eye and this is gonna walk you through, this is a magnifier, up here, this is gonna be the monitor. So it's gonna tell you how hot the device is on the eyelids. And then it's gonna tell you how long to put the heat. And then afterwards, it's gonna tell you to express it. So on this thumb piece, when you're going up, that's when we're gonna heat it, then you'll go down to express it. And so it's just gonna read it, it's gonna go through that for you. But what does the data show? And so this is a head-to-head -head study looking at non-inferiority comparing the ILEX versus the LIPA flow and what they found at week four visit, mean my bombing land score, tear film breakup time, OSDI, all did improve. And so it is another option for our patient, small footprint. You can move it to various, uh, various uh, uh, exam rooms, uh, very safe. Uh, you, you can see this here. But how, how quick does it work? Well, you're telling me uh, that I need this, but how long is it going to take for me to feel better? So this is a study, this is from David Geffen's group. There was about 30 patients in here. Non-randomized non open label. Primary endpoints is the mybomian gland score, as well as the tear film breakup time. And then also take a look at the speed uh, questionnaire. So within a week, 315 15% improvement in the mybomian gland score. Tear film breakup time, it was about 2.6 seconds in this study. So 71% within a week, as well as the symptom scores improvement 50% for our patients on a daily basis. So great, it works quick. Well, how long does this work? Well, Gina Wesley, um, th this was a study that, that she, she uh, presented looking at 236 subjects, looking at the meibomian gland score, as well as the symptom score. And here you can see improvement in the meibomian gland score, but also improvement in the symptoms for our patients. And so another technology that we can utilize and recommend this is a, the newer one, um, it's not available yet. This is the ILUX squared. And so we were able to utilize this on some patients. This was Mrs. Smith and her name was really Mrs. Smith. And here I said, this, you've been suffering. You've been on cyclosporin. These are your glands. This is what I'm going to prescribe for you, recommend for you. Talk about patient education. 
this is your junk that came out of your eyelids. And so we did this now, but this is something we're, we're gonna need to do again, maybe six months, maybe a year. So it does have mybography on the hand. So it's the same handheld unit, but on the next generation, the ILUX squared is gonna have mybography. It's also gonna have video capabilities so you can show the patients the goo that's coming out of their meibomian glands. Very effective and wonderful video that I love to share. So IPL, I know that they're out there as well. And so this is something that I've had experience with for the last six months now that I relocated to, uh, to Nevada. And so essentially putting the ultrasound gel, doing the light flashes up to about 1200 uh, nanometers um, or, or intensity in, in light. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that intense light to help constrict the blood vessels, address the inflammation, but it also helps with the meibomian glands. And so some people do express afterwards after each treatment. It's one treatment every three to four weeks. And then, uh, and then in our practice, we often follow that up with thermal pulsation afterwards. And so how I tell patients, it's almost like you're gonna have a rubber band flicked on your face uh, several times, like about 50 times twice in one session, but has been very effective in my experience in patients that I've done this for. Uh, one of what, what, some of our colleagues, Stephen Dell, Derek Cunningham, this is a paper that they presented or, or published uh, several years ago, looking at the improvement in the symptoms, which did improve by about 55%, but also the tear film breakup time that improved by about 95%. So another option to help our patients with their signs and their symptoms. They looked at some other, um, uh, other uh, endpoints as well. But what about the inflammation? So this is a study by Lou. So, well, you tell me it helps on inflammation, but where's the data? And so here you can see it does address the IL-17A and the IL-6, statistically significant decreases compared to sham at each time measured. The PGE2, so the, the pro-inflammatory prostaglandin, shows statistically significant decrease compared to sham. Also, so they're feeling better, but the byproduct is increase in collagen, right? Stimulate the collagen production. And so there is the aesthetic aspect that patients do benefit from them. And it's one of the hottest topics right now when it comes to ocular surface disease, whether it's IPL, whether it's radio frequency. Here's just some uh, photos. This is from uh, Laura Perryman, the dry eye master, looking at different uh, uses for, for acute chalasia, or if patients have the, the baggy skin, this is something that can help with the aesthetics portion of their eyes. And then also if they have rosacea after several treatments that this does improve over time. So, Yes, they're feeling better. The byproduct or side effect is the cosmesis is going to improve as well. Radio frequency, there's several units out there uh, as well. And so looking at this, putting the ultrasound gel and utilizing the radio frequency to help increase collagen uh, production, but also helping to melt the myobum and help with the meibomian glands. And so this is uh, something, there's only one study I'm aware of. It did improve in about 50% of patients, uh, Whitney Hauser and Dr. Christensen out of SCO. It did improve the lipid layer thickness in about 50% of patients, but then it also did help uh, improve the, the tear film breakup time uh, for the patients as, as well. And here you can see pre-treatment, post-treatment, the crow's feet that the patient does have, increased collagen production, by, byproduct is cosmesis. Low level light therapy, is anyone using this? Another option that we have uh, for our patients, uh, I had a unit, I did them up on about 15 patients and essentially it's like the brightest light that they've ever seen with their eyes closed, but they put this mask on for about 15 minutes. The red light photobiomodulation or stimulation is going to help with the meibomian glands. And so low level light therapy has been utilized within dermatology for many years, uh, but this is something that we're starting to see in the ocular disease as well as the uh, uh, the eye care space. So the red light is absorbed in the cellular mitochondria and stimulates ATP production. Essentially, it's going to help with the collagen and elastin from the light stimulation. And so that's what the mask looks like. So you do it for about 15 minutes. And so the, the patients, the 15 patients I did it on, uh, they did notice improvement on it, but this is, uh, this, I only had it for those 15 patients. Uh, and so um, it is very exciting technology. It's just, we have almost every single technology. So we have to decide, do we need another technology in our practice? But I know uh, um, uh, Carl Stonecipher, he's done a lot of different studies on low light level therapy. 
and it's been uh, made a huge impact on our MGD patients. Uh, you can use it with other colors, uh, yellow light, uh, detoxifying. So, it, so if you're working with an oculoplastic surgeon or someone's getting a blepharoplasty, that's a way that we could minimize the scar formation is with the various uh, different light. Well, and so here you can see if a patient does have styes and chalasia, these are just case reports, but after a couple of treatments, it is another way that, you know, many of our patients, they get styes. They're like, why do I keep getting these styes? Well, here, we, let's consider this low level light therapy for our patients. It helps with rosacea. You can use different color masks uh, several weeks apart. Uh, help, helpful for Demodex uh, as well for our patients. So there's so many different in-office procedures. So how do we choose? Well, that's where we come and talk with the, uh, the various vendors and have them share with you their information. Take a look at the studies. You know, what are the clinical studies? How many patients were in the study? Who, who, was the, who did the study? Was it, uh, was it sponsored by the company or was it an independent study? Talk to your colleagues. How's it working within your practice? Ask them, how did they decide which one they're bringing into the practice? The main thing, we have great technologies, is pick one. Start somewhere. If you need to start somewhere, the easiest is probably gonna be microblepharal exfoliation for our patients where we can use the blephex and clean off the lids and the meibomian glands. Or you can do the, uh, uh, there's different uh, the, the in-office procedures, whether it's thermal pulsation or manual uh, expression. So for the last few minutes, we're gonna talk about what's new in blepharitis. And so this is our Demodex. And this is our Demodex mite. Then we have our meibomian gland. And then also what can we do with the trigeminal nerve? And so blepharitis is large and underserved. You can see up to about 25 million uh, Americans uh, or is the prevalence of Demodex uh, blepharitis. We see those collarettes. That is the hallmark sign that the patient does have Demodex. And I'll show you some studies here shortly. We know about the different forms of folliculorum, which is in the eyelash follicle, but also the brevis, which is gonna be found in the meibomian gland. And so it's essentially that mite waste. And so Mrs. Smith, you have mite waste on your eyes that we have to clear off. Here's a study by Gal. So what, this was done in like 2005. And in the study, if the patient had one collarette, they'd pull it, they'd put it underneath a slide in a, in a magnifier or a microscope, and then they'd see confirm the presence of Demodex. If they had no collarettes, but they were using lid scrubs, they still pulled the lashes, and they found that 50% of patients still had Demodex. If they had no collarettes and were not doing lid scrubs, 7% still had Demodex. Uh, so uh, my site was one of the sites, uh, there were uh, seven other sites here, looking at 180 consecutive patients. And so all I was doing was looking, did they have Demodex, yes or no? And we all miss it. And the only way we're not gonna miss it is during our evaluation, having that patient look down, because if you're just looking straight at the lid, you're gonna miss it every single time. Have that patient look down. If you see those collarettes, then we know that that patient does have Demodex. And so 180 patients, do they have Demodex? Look down. I found that 42% of my patients did have collarettes on their eyes. Within the whole group, we had over 1,100 patients. About 58% of patients did have collarettes uh, on their eyes. And so it's prevalent, but what do we do for it? And we know that tea tree oil, there's been different products out there. Some may sting or burn, and we're not gonna get compliance because it doesn't feel good. Patients may or may not use it. Several years ago, many of us did this just for fun because we have so much time on our hands, would pull an eyelash, put it on the slide, show it to the patient and say, hey, here's your mites that are on your eyelids. Very effective at, uh, at uh, helping improve compliance. Uh, but this is something was, was always fun for show and tell with our patients. The traditional treatments, as we know, is gonna be the tea tree oil formulations. And so if they have it, we do prescribe it. But typically if I see a patient that has the blepharitis, going back to compliance, Let's say a patient has, whether it's Demodex or any blepharitis, three plus anterior blepharitis. We prescribe lid scrubs. We tell them to do it twice a day. Come back in three to four weeks. How much blepharitis do they still have? Two to three plus blepharitis, because they ain't doing it. We can tell them what to do. They're not doing it. They're not scrubbing hard enough. And so oftentimes that's why I go with a micro exfoliation. So we can take it out of the patient's hands and address their lashes, but also those meibomian glands uh, as well. If they have Demodex and I'm doing a, a Blefx, I will use the tea tree oil, uh, one of the, the, the solutions 
uh, to address the address the condition. So this is a fun video to watch. Demodex mites are the most common ectoparasites found on Do humans. Do we have audio or can we get While audio back there? they are highly prevalent in low numbers, an infestation of mites can lead to blepharitis and meibomian gland disease. There are two species of Demodex, Folliculorum and Brevis, that live on the skin of the face and eyelids. Demodex folliculorum inhabits the eyelash follicles where they scrape the epithelial cell lining with their claws and excrete digestive enzymes to feed on the oily sebum deep in the follicle, causing inflammation, hyperemia, and irritation. Both species of mites can carry bacteria on their surface or in their gut, causing inflammation of the surrounding tissue. Demodex brevis prefers the rich mybum in the mybomian glands on the posterior lid margin. As the mites thrive in this nutrient-rich environment, they begin to proliferate, causing disease by mechanical, chemical, and bacterial mechanisms. This leads to more tissue damage and blockage of the glands and follicles, leading to further inflammation. The overgrowth of the mites in the follicle leads to follicular distension, misdirected lashes, matarosis, and irritation. As mites proliferate, the partially digested epithelial cells keratin, mite waste, and eggs combine to form collarettes, which can be seen with a slit lamp. These collarettes are a pathognomonic sign of demodex infestation and are- For the sake of time, I'm gonna skip the rest of that. Uh, but what I was getting to is what is a potential option? And this is TPO3 from Tarsus Pharmaceuticals. So this is twice a day for about six weeks, looking at the, uh, the, the cholerate cure. So getting rid of the collarettes, but then also mite eradication. So it's twice a day. Uh, this is looking at uh, Lotolaner, which has been used in veterinary medicine. And so using, using this twice a day, this is without lid scrubs. So putting the patient on it twice a day, you can see how it improved the blepharitis for the patients. Then actually Demodex as well. IPL is another treatment uh, for, Demodex, uh, for Demodex too. Uh, but this is very impressive for our patients. With the clinical data, this is a 14 day study. You can read this. But looking at the early data, you do the treatment for six weeks and, and looking at over time, that cure rate and eradication rate stays the same or for about six months. And so likely we're gonna have to do it again in about six months, but treat and follow, we're gonna be able to potentially manage our patients with the TPO3. So what else is available? Novo3, so this is from Bausch and Lomb. And so this is looking at treating both the signs and symptoms of dry eye disease associated with MGD. And so this is looking at, so Novo3 is a, uh, is a drug molecule itself. So it's not a combination of chemicals and uh, inactives and, and in, actives and inactives in a solution. This is just what it is, Novo3. But essentially what it can potentially do is get into the meibomian glands, break up the obstruction and help with the uh, MGD issues that the patients may have. It lasts on their eyes for, for up to 240 minutes, preservative free, no blurring for the patient as well. And so essentially it's gonna have a protective barrier for the lipid component of the tears, but it's also gonna be able to penetrate potentially into the glands to help with any of those obstructions. And so here's some studies looking at Novo3 in the literature now. Uh, BNL actually, this is the early data looking at the CK study uh, they actually just finished their second phase three study. Each, each of those phase three studies, there were 600 patients looking at improvement in corneal, total corneal staining at day 57, day 57, but also looking at the symptoms of eye dryness and they found it was statistically significant in both. And so we might have another option here in the near future. And then the last, for the last minute, looking at keratolytics. So we mentioned hyperkeratinization does occur within MGD. And so if we can use keratolytics, such as celsium sulfide, to break up the disulfide bonds, we already use keratolytics within dermatology, whether it's going to be with the chemical peels, but using something like selenium sulfide to break up that keratin is another potential option that we have for our patients. So break down the keratin, the keratostatics, so it's going to slow down the, the, the rate of keratinocyte proliferation, but also stimulate lipid production or lipogenesis for our patients. And so I'm just gonna, there, th this is being presented at Ascaris. So, so this is looking at some of the, the data and the various formulations of this. And so this treatment is not twice a day, it's twice a week. 
is all that, that these patients were doing. And here, looking at the design, looking at patients up to about three months, looking at change uh, from baseline and my bumming gland score, my bumming gland yield uh, uh, secretions, but also the OSDI. And here you can see number of open glands. It did improve over three months at twice a week, as well as the quality of the myobum coming out at two treatments a week, but then also looking at the symptoms, 42% of patients achieve symptom pre compared to about 15% on the vehicle. So another potential that we have to use the dermatological approach to MGD. And so it's pretty exciting. I know I'm mixing a lot of dry eye with MGD, but you have to always address both. Uh, it's only non-obvious MGD. Yes, we can do mybography to look at the glands, but we have to press on it to see what is the function of those glands. We know the root cause. If we're gonna prescribe a tear, uh, we want to be uh, proactively prescribe a lipid-based tear, pre pre preferably preservative-free to address the surface and just be on the lookout. There's many exciting things coming on in the near future. So thank you very much for you all to be, for letting me be here. And thank you, Steph, and woo you. <laughs>